Hi everybody, my name is Joey Cross. I'm a PhD candidate in the University of Chicago, Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations. I, my field is Egyptology and Hebrew Bible, and I study ancient storytelling. That's what I'm here to talk about today. I'm really grateful to the OI for giving me the chance to uh, share my research in this format. What I'll be talking about specifically um, is my dissertation, which is on Judean and Egyptian novellas of the Achaemenid and Hellenistic period. Now, you're probably wondering, what's a novella? What is it about those periods? Why are those there novellas in those periods that are worth researching? Well, we'll get to that. Uh, before I sh sort of share you some interesting things I've been doing lately in my project, I want to talk about storytelling. I want to sort of set the table for this uh, feast of storytelling, so to speak, by letting you know what it's like in the sort of day-to-day -day sort of work that I do as a scholar studying this kind of thing. Um, what are the questions that I ask? What are the things I'm interested in? And importantly, just uh, I just want to give you an idea of what it's like to reconstruct a world of storytelling just based on the kind of meager evidence we have. So let's get started. What are some of the ins and outs of this art? Let's take a story-specific focus to begin with. Plot. Plot is a good place to start. Every story has a plot. What is a plot? It's a sequence of events that's meaningful. It has a goal. There's a beginning and a middle and an end. Now, every story might have a plot, but not every story just has one plot. Stories can have many plots that are related in different ways. They can be episodes that follow one another that are sort of part of a general narrative arc that the whole story has. There can even be plots that are shared in, that are shared in among different individual stories like in a cycle, like Star Wars, uh, like the early works in, of, of the Sumerian Gilgamesh uh, poems. Those are, those are parts of a cycle. There's a story that can be shared in a general story, but it only is realized in individual stories. Um, stories can nest, or I should say plots can nest also. One plot can have subplots. Characters can tell other characters' stories that have their own plots. There can be plots within plots within plots. Now, uh, Certain kinds of stories lend themselves to certain kinds of plots, and so being able to match the kind of plots you observe with different genres of storytelling is really important. That's where I always start. Whenever I start studying a story, uh, I try to get a handle on what its plot is, how does it divide up, those kind of issues. Next up is character. So who do we see in this story world, right? Every story is a world that's presented to us that has its own sort of coherent laws and logic, and really... You can make the argument that characters are more important than plot, in fact. Um, these are the people that we see, that we hear, that we encounter. So, are they playing to types that we're familiar with? Are they heroes? Are they villains? Are there more specific roles? Think about a film noir movie, right? The, the detective that has all the emotional baggage, right? That's a good example of a type. Um, understanding when you study ancient stories or I should say discovering in ancient stories, types like this is really important because it helps you understand what audiences expect. So there's more, though. What do we know about a character? Do we have access to their inner thoughts? Do we just know what they say from the outside just by what they speak? Do we have backstory? Um, you might have heard the distinction between round and flat characters. Are these characters filled out in an emotional way? Do, do they come to life on the page? Or are they kind of thin and maybe only means to an end. You might think that round characters, like characters with depth and ambiguity, are only a product of the modern world. That's absolutely not true. They're absolutely round and very interesting characters all over ancient literature. Time and place. It's, each story has a very specific anchoring in a spatio-temporal sphere. So a good example are classical tragedies from Athens. Right, Sophocles, excuse me, Oedipus, Aeschylus. Those plays are told in one setting, one place, and a very short amount of time. Anything else that goes outside of that has to be retold by a character, right? Like the messengers, for example, if you're familiar with like Oedipus the king. Um, certain genres of storytelling uh, correspond to lar large sweeps, maybe in, like in, in an epic, like Gilgamesh or the Odyssey, right? The Odyssey takes place over a couple of years. But in some ways, as a story, it begins when Odysseus was born, right? When his nurse discovers his scar, the, st the storyteller helps us, rem like, reminisces for us about when the nurse met Odysseus as a baby. And so all of a sudden, we zoom back to his, his birth, 
right? So the way that time and space are manipulated is a really important part of storytelling. And the, the, also the setting. I haven't talked about space yet. So does it take place inside or outside? Is it out in the public sphere? Is it private? Is it just vague and we don't know? These things are important also. How about theme? Some stories just seem to maybe more modern story examples of storytelling just kind of mirror everyday life, right? Their theme is just human existence and all its flaws and its thrills, right? Some stories have a very specific angle. Maybe they have a theme about fate, how you can't avoid fate. Maybe they have a theme, I'm thinking about some Egyptian stories, about how magical knowledge shouldn't be shared, how there's a secrecy to it. Maybe they have a theme about being dedicated to your religious values uh, in a foreign context. There's a lot of Judean novellas that are like that. So if you can identify a specific theme, that's important. Not all of them have that, but some definitely do. Finally, uh, the narrator is really interesting also because that is the conduit that the story reaches us. Every story has a storyteller, and uh, storytelling isn't just a... The storyteller, the narrator, is not just a transparent sort of uh, medium. Some, some narrators speak as an I. They have, like, an ego, and they even, like, took place, took part in the events themselves. Some narrators are completely, what we would say is omniscient, right? They're, they step back. They're not a part of the story world, but they know everything, right? We might think of them as, an, as just the author speaking, but um, that's a kind of narrator, a special omniscient narrator, and the, we expect that in novels a lot of the time. So when you put these together, um, they help build a picture about how certain works of storytelling work. So as I study these novellas, which I'll tell you a lot more about, I'm looking, especially at these examples, these sort of um, features of storytelling, and seeing if I can notice common things, commonalities, among all the examples of this genre. That's why it matters. You have to look at how the story works, the actual ins and outs of the storytelling, the way the rubber meets the road. How does somebody hear this story? How is it told? What is the experience like? If we have a good grasp on these issues, I think that then we can jump to deeper ones that aren't just uh, hovering in the, text of the, in the world of the text, right? Issues that have to do with the source of the story, the life of the story itself. So here's some other important issues. Is this story oral or written? Now, everything I work on is written. It was pen to paper, or really more accurately for what, I'm, for what we're talking about for ancient Egypt, for ancient Judea, brush to paper, right? Brush to papyrus. <laughs> uh, everything I study, much of the literature you read, was written, right? Although I think 95% of all stories were never written down, right? Storytelling is innately, inherently oral. It's something that's passed down from person to person. It's enjoyed in, a, in, in a communal settings, and people have stories memorized. They make up stories as they go. You have things that have happened to you in the past, and when you tell it, you make a story about it. That doesn't mean it's fake, right? Written literature can have features of oral storytelling. The most sort of prominent example of that in the last hundred years or so is Homer. And the Perry Lord hypothesis of Homer is that there are traces of oral storytelling like that have been left in these epics. And whoever wrote it down just sort of recorded the, the text that was transmitted to them, but things that, that professional storytellers used, like, like epithets, right? Like repeated phrases that characterize people, those kinds of things are left in there. So when I look at the novellas, I'm saying, what are some features of this that, uh, that seem to be, be, they have to come from a setting where it's been written, or do they suggest an oral background? The author in the audience is maybe the most uh, crucial thing to find out, although it's maybe also the hardest. Uh, maybe that'll be the last chapter right, of my dissertation. I think this connects very well with the literary features we started out with. I mentioned character. Certain characters have uh, expectations that are that are foisted on the audience, right? Um, recognizing shared types of characters makes me be able to start to put the picture together and think about who the audience was, and themes also. So if I'm looking at stories that I think were written and enjoyed within circles of priests, I'm looking for religious themes. Now, what if I am very certain through other lines of argumentation that the stories I'm looking at were enjoyed by priests, but there's not a lot of religious uh, themes to them? That's really interesting. Where were these stories performed? 
Was it a scroll that somebody pulled off the shelf and read it themselves after dinner? I don't think so, uh, actually. Um, literature was never really read to yourself. You never did silent reading. Uh, every day I try to get my six-year-old to spend time silent reading, right? It's like a part of our sort of everyday life now. But in the ancient world, reading was done out loud. There's a famous, I hope I'm getting this right, anecdote in the Confessions of St. Augustine where um, they're, they're amazed and they see somebody, I think it's Anselm, just like reading to himself. But that, his lips are like murmuring, you know. This was not expected. Stories were read. Copies of stories written down were transcripts for performance. Somebody read them out loud and were enjoyed. Here's my button. How are these stories collected? So, uh, talking about transcripts for performance, let's say, were a lot of very short stories put together on one sort of convenient scroll to access, and you could sort of scroll through it and pick what you wanted. Um, were stories so long that they had to be stored in multiple volumes? That says a lot for how they would have been accessed. If I had a, a story that was two scrolls long and I went and sat down and was going to perform it, how would I choose where to start? Is this something that would have been read out loud continually? So that goes back to the issue of performance. If we have stories that are rather short uh, that existed by themselves that were collected independently, that probably suggests that they were enjoyed that way. But if we have a much longer work with page numbers, and with headings that were very complex, they must have been integrated into other kinds of interactions, right? Maybe they were um, referenced, they were cross-referenced. Maybe they were read in like lit liturgical settings or something. So the actual way the story is collected and preserved is really, really important for understanding its life. The last thing, and this is what I'll sort of digress into or funnel myself into for 10 minutes or so, is the sources and the connections we see in stories. Um, where did the story come from? Is it based on a, a legend everybody knows and it's a retelling of it? Right? We enjoy retellings of things. Um, is this story evocative of other stories we know? Now, folklore is a big part of this research of sto in storytelling, and we know that stories travel across the world, and the different stories may not be identical, but they have certain themes and plots and characters that we recognize. And we say that it has sort of a connection of folklore, and these are things people um, share. Uh, that's what I want to look at right now. So I want to like dive right into some ancient Egyptian examples and show you sort of how um, how the world of literature sort of is like can be laid out in front of us. We can see all these fascinating connections before I get into the novellas. Okay, so let's just jump in here. This is one fragment of many, many, many. Um, I picked a fragmentary one because I wanted you to see what I have to deal with and what people, like, scholars like me, have to work with all the time. Uh, where's my laser? Like, right, like wormholes, right? Like, this is what a lot of these things look like for us. It's very unfortunate. Anyway, um, this is one of the most popular compositions from the Greco-Roman period of ancient Egypt. It's called the Myth of the Sun's Eye. This is a story collection. It's huge. Um, it's over 100 columns long. By column, I mean the page. We'll look at some columns in a minute. It's incredibly long, and it's a collection of animal fables. So you're probably thinking of Aesop, right? Thinking of things like the tortoise and the hare, right? Um, these kind of fables are incredibly popular. They've always been popular, and there's a lot of examples from the ancient world we're going to look at. The Myth of the Sun's Eye is one example of a collection of animal fables. Now, they're not just written right next to each other. They're framed. There's a frame story. So the frame story is complicated. It has a lot of deep religious and mythological meaning. The basic outline is that the goddess... Uh, the, uh, um, Tefnut, represented as a cat, has fled Egypt into, into the Sudan. And um, th either Thoth or the son or the descendant of Thoth, a representation of him in the form of an ape, goes down and tries to convince the goddess to return. And so there's a discussion that involves all these animal fables. Um, this is a very complicated uh, work of literature that's not really been translated much into English. It's not widely available. Um, I believe that there's a lot of ongoing work on it, and hopefully more editions will appear soon. But I wanted to look at one specific story uh, in this myth of the sun's eye. Yeah. So I'm going to show you a couple extracts of stories. I'm not going to read them out, uh, but please pause the video and have a look um, and, and read it for yourself. I encourage you to do that. So there's a st one of the animal fables that's told in this Myth of the Sun's Eye, this huge scroll full of stories, is about a lion who's wandering around and he keeps seeing other animals that are like in dire straits. So there's a cow or an ox that has his horns cut off, and the lion says, what's the matter with you? And the, the ox says, well, man has cut my horns off. Okay, 
he sees another a bear. His claws are clipped, like cut off. And the man, the lion says, "What's going on with you?" The bear says, "Man has cut my my my, my claws off." So this lion is getting more and more angry, encountering all these animals that man has harmed in some way. Finally, he comes in, and he's, he gets angry and angry. Finally, he he meets a lion, a fellow lion. Right, he, this is a lion we're talking about that is trapped under a tree trunk. And the lion says, "What happened to you?" Well, man came. And he he was going to give me a protective amulet, and he tricked me. And I put my paw on this this uh, this tree that was being chopped, and he closed the trunk back down on my paw, so I'm stuck here. So now the lion is in search of this man. He wants to find him. He's angry. He's going to st- seek vengeance in some way, right? I'm better than man. Nobody's better than me, right? Lions are the kings, right? They're the kings of the animal world. So who's this man to rival him? Okay, so he meets a mouse on the way, and he's about to crush the mouse under his paw, right? This is just a raw expression of blunt power right the mouse is like don't don't do that to me don't quash me i know i'm inferior but you might need me with someday i have my own place to my own role to play okay so maybe you know what's going to happen here right that's another part of storytelling uh it's fun to know what's coming right and to see how it plays out okay so the lion gets trapped by the man in a net mouse comes along chews the net up and the lion escapes okay uh you probably recognize this coming from Aesop, right? Aesop's fable, The Lion and the Mouse. Um, this is a fable that we know is in Ace, the collection of Aesop, which is from Greece, from ancient Greece, and also in ancient Egypt. There's more, though. Another version of this story, and so I would call Aesop and the, the, the Egyptian story roughly contemporaneous, right? They're very, these, these collections are very complicated, and we're not going to get into these issues. Um, there's another version of this story. It's from India. Okay, This is the Panchatantra. So let me talk about the Panchatantra for a minute. The Panchatantra is probably one of the most popular books in the world. Um, It's been translated into dozens of languages. Its origin is ancient India. It probably came together in the first few centuries CE. What you're looking at here, excuse me, this is a 17th century uh, um, manuscript of it. Um, You see the birds and the fish, right? This is a collection of animal fables. This is what the Panchatantra is. It's a collection of animal fables from ancient India, like I said, first few centuries CE, but these stories probably are much older, right? We have the evidence from Egypt and Aesop that's, that's show they think these things spread and are probably older than, than their written form. There's a frame story and then the animal fables, just like uh, the myth, right? So the story is that the, the, there's a king who has three sons, they're uh, morons, and they're going to be bad, they're not, they're not good princes, and so the king hires the sage Vishnu Sarma to come and teach them statescraft. And the way he does it is he tells them animal fables, and that's the five books. Um, and so the, all the fables in the Panchatantra, in its sort of original setting, have this air of statescraft about them. It's about how to deal with enemies, how to make allies, how to know when to break treaties. But it's all told as animal fables. So let's look at an example. This is a text, this is a story that parallels so closely what we see in Aesop and the myth of the sun's eye. But it's not about lions, it's about elephants. So again, I'm not going to read this out loud, but the basic gist of the story is that elephants are trampling around, and they happen to be stepping all over Mouse Town. So Mouse Town is a place where mice live, right? Again, this is very political, right? Uh, the mice are getting decimated by these huge elephants, so they come together in a council, and they decide we have to beg them to stop stepping all over our town. So they go over, and the, the elephants are very gracious and like, yes, we'll, we'll stop. Uh, part of the way that these mice convince the elephants to not step on them is saying, you know, we're, we have, we're useful also, right? We could be of use to you. And guess what happens? You know what's going to happen. So these, one of these, these, a bunch of these elephants get captured by a huntsman. So the huntsman, the hunter, he's the villain in the Panchatantra. He's all over these stories. Um, just like in the, the, the lion uh, in search of a man we saw from Egypt. Um, I think it's fascinating how, how uh, this, this uh, particular perf- human profession is, is, is harnessed as the embodiment of sort of evil in these stories. Um, anyway, so a huntsman has captured these elephants. The mice find out. They come and they eat up the, cor- the, the, uh, the cords that tie them up, and the elephants are free. So very similar. This is the Panchatantra. Um, Here's an addition I've shared with you here. Uh, there's one also published by Oxford University Press. Um, it's, an, it's an absolutely charming and incredible collection. What's really, really fascinating about them, I have to sort of move on, but the fables are um, 
they're in there's they're inboxed. So there's the frame story, and in each story, um, there's a main each book there's a main story. So the first book is about this jackal that tries to convince this lion to to stop being friends with a with a bull. It sounds kind of like a cartoon, but I but it's not. Um, but in that story, the jackal tells stories. People tell the jackal stories, and in the stories themselves, that somebody tells the jackal, let's say, somebody in that story tells a story, and each story has a moral. So it's like a Russian doll. Um, each book of the Panchatantra is like that. It's amazing, and as you can imagine, different editions have different stories. So this is sort of like a very adaptable format of a story collection to have this embeddedness going on. Um, so that's the Panchatantra. I the, the image I showed you earlier had a little bit of a vignette on it. Here's another one. This is a, a story that you might be familiar with. I think there's a version uh, in the Br'er Rabbit stories about a turtle that don't, won't stop talking, and these birds are carrying him away because he wants to fly. Well, there's different versions. In one, he wants to fly. In another one, he wants to move out of his pond. He doesn't like it anymore. But he can't fly. He can't go fast because he's slow. That's what's great about animal fables. Each animal is distinct in its features. So in Indian thought, right, this is the word dharma. Each animal has their own kind of dharma. The dharma of a turtle is to be slow and methodical, methodical and wise, but there's a limitation. He can't move too fast. He can't flee, right? Um, crows or ravens are very cunning. Mice are sort of humble but wise, okay? So anyway, this turtle wants to fly. He can't stop talking, so he, but he opens his mouth, and the, the birds are carrying him, and he falls to his death. Um, this is an illustration of that from the same uh, uh, 17th century uh, manuscript I showed you. This is the version that I discovered in a storybook I have that I read to my children. Um, the turtle who could not stop talking. And uh, I can't embed a hyperlink on this page, but um, here's a very short URL. This is a really great resource for studying folklore. And uh, this is where you can pull up all the different examples of this turtle who wouldn't stop talking, if you're interested in pursuing this further. Before I move on, just a couple more illustrations from the Panchatantra. This is actually from a version that was transmitted via Syriac and also uh, Persian through Iran that was called Kalila Wadimna. Um, it's an adaptation, sort of translation uh, and modification of the Panchatantra. This is a, a mouse that keeps eating a monk's food, and he has to keep sort of hitting it with a stick. Um, I just really like it. Next we have something that parallels what I was saying earlier, that, or illustrates what I said earlier, I should say. These ja this jackal that's trying to convince this lion on, on the left here not, to, uh, not to, uh, or to, to stop being friends with the bull. We see these same kind of vignettes in ancient Egypt. This is something we actually have in the Oriental Institute. This is very pretty famous. You've, I'm sure you've seen it before. This is an ostracon from Daryl Medina. If you remember, Daryl Medina is the workman's village that's sort of on the other side of the hill from the Valley of the Kings. This is where the people who painted and decorated the tombs lived. Um, this comes from there. So this was a scratch paper of some sort. And it looks like it's illustrating a fable. Now, we don't have a fable that matches this exactly, right? But there's a boy here. We know he's a young boy. he's a young man, not a not a, a grown up, because he's naked and his, his sort of hairdo. They have the long lock. That's sort of typical the representation of children in Egyptian art. Um, he's being beaten by a cat, and it looks like a mouse is the pharaoh, or maybe some other, maybe a vizier. You know, maybe the second in command. Um, so was this was this somebody practicing how to draw and they're remembering their favorite story? Was this just totally made up on the spot? Uh, this has been written about a lot. Um, but I sort of wanted to, to pause on it for a minute because um, what I study and a lot of the storytelling, it's important to keep in mind that it, it, it occupies this space between serious and not serious. We can treat it very seriously as literature. And the word literature is, it seems like it has a capital L, right? It's, very, it's, a, it's a very sort of imposing term. Um, but a lot of this would have been uh, not what we call literature. It would have been diversion. Um, so, yeah, I want to always keep in mind that maybe we could call it the highbrow and the lowbrow aspects of what, what these things we're studying are. So, uh, before we get to the novellas, if I can push this a little further, I showed you examples from the Panchatantra of a story that we have also in Egypt and in Greece. I could have given you a couple others. There's not any more time for that. Um, is it just coincidence? Obviously not. But how did that transmission actually happen, right? This is where you can get into the issue of social history, of politics, of economics, of trade, and start to fill out the map of the world that can underlie this phenomenon of shared stories. So I wanted to briefly mention um, this uh, emperor from India, Ashoka. 
he uh, has provided us the first written evidence of actually about Buddhism. So uh, here I have a, an inscription of Ashoka's. That's him represented here with his two wives. This is Ashoka right there. Um, he died in uh, 232 BCE. This inscription comes from about 260. Uh, at the top is Greek, and at the bottom is Aramaic. So this was erected in Afghanistan. I, I believe it's still in situ in Afghanistan. Um, although maybe when I, what I read that one was an outdated source. That seems kind of hard to believe. Uh, nevertheless, uh, this was sort of like a, what we would recognize as a boundary stele from the ancient Near East, right, where the king has decreed the boundaries of his land and sort of expressed his, his magnificence. Um, Ashoka made a lot of these. One of them, well, so this one is in Greek and Aramaic, which tells you that there's a cosmopolitan, maybe, mix of different types of peoples that he's speaking to. One of them actually mentions Ptolemy. Ptolemy II, uh, Philadelphus, the Greek ruler of Egypt. Uh, who died in 247 BCE. So I have here a copy. Uh, that's This is a Sanskrit inscription by Ashoka. And in it, he brags that um, that the Dharma, which in technical terms of Buddhism, uh, is a, the teachings of Buddha. So the teachings of Buddha, Buddhist religion, um, has been spread far and wide. And so uh, even as far as Egypt. So we have concrete evidence of people from India uh, having contact like this. And if an if a emperor is bragging about it, there must have been something real, real on the ground, real, real happening. We know of spice trades and pepper trades starting in this Hellenistic period, but especially in the Roman and the Sasanian periods. Um, all sorts of international trade, trade routes were opened and in this sort of period of world empires. So there's no, there's no reason to like doubt that stories could be shared in this way. A good way to visualize that is to think about language. So even in the Iron Age, but especially once once the Achaemenid Empire sort of rose, Aramaic spread throughout the Middle East into uh, further east into Asia, all the way to Bactria and India, um, and of course Egypt. Um, Aramaic was the official language, the chancellery language of the Persian Empire, and so that facilitated contact. We have works of literature written in Aramaic. Uh, that have survived in Egypt and elsewhere, that were, that were even translated into other languages like Hebrew and Demotic, into Demotic Egyptian. So Aramaic, and then later Greek, which is the map on the bottom, could serve as a conduit of this kind of thing, if it wasn't just word of mouth. So uh, that's it for connections of stories. What I want to talk about now, in the remaining time I have, is my own personal research, novellas. So... What is a novella? What do I mean by that? <clears throat> well, uh, it's related to our word novel. In fact, our word novel, so it's what you think. A book, right? A, a book, the, a story that you read, the book length novel. Um, that comes from the word novella. Novella came first. Um, maybe the first novel we'd recognize as such was Don Quixote, but um, novel is actually derived from novella. Novella came from sort of two main sources in the way we use it today. Um, Boccaccio, his Decameron, um, those it's another story collection, just like the, a few we've seen. Those are all, uh, he calls the individual stories novellas. Novella is an Italian word, which means something new. So these were short stories that were not retellings of classical myths. They were not old stories. They might have had folkloric dimensions, absolutely. But they were something just sort of novel, right? We can use that word as an adjective. Goethe, the German thinker, also uh, was one of the first, um, a little bit later than Boccaccio, um, to like write a lot about novellas, and he said the same sort of things. He had more of a literary definition. They were something new, right? They were short. They had a turning point. They had a major symbol. Um, Goethe's thought kind of started a whole blossoming of German novellas. So that's kind of the source of where we get the word. Um, just sort of define it in a sort of easy way. Novella, you could say, is a example of prose narrative fiction. So fiction, something that didn't happen, but it acts like it did right? It's not necessarily a true record, but it seems like it. It's believable. It's narrative. That means it's a story that has a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's a logical sequence. And it's prose. Maybe that's the most important part. It's not poetry. We know of plenty of poetic stories, right? Paradise Lost, The Iliad, right? Maybe Gilgamesh. These are poetic. Uh, novellas aren't. Novellas are written in prose. This is something that approaches everyday language. It's not a language that's... Uh, broken up into aesthetic units that have their own meaning independent of the meaning of the text. 
like rhyme schemes or meter. This is just language that's pure and clear, ready for the thoughts and the ideas in the story to come through. Prose. Okay, so they're prose. They're told by an omniscient third-person narrator. So this narrator is not involved in the events of the story. Uh, some novellas, I should say, have narrators in them, that characters that are narrators, right? So a good example is the story of Setna Kamwas, Setna One. Um, one of the characters plays the role of a narrator for a long time and tells a story. Nevertheless, in all novellas, on the outer level, there is one narrator who is not part of the story. Now, novellas are not that long, so they are, I don't know, uh, you can measure the time to read them in maybe hours or so, definitely not minutes, definitely not over days. It's a single setting, digestible kind of thing. Now, I, I mentioned Setna 1 having sort of these levels. Um, they definitely can have complex plots, but all novellas have a unitary basis. There's one plot that might have subplots. There might be, there's often very engaging complexity, but there's an overriding unity that, uh, that, that, that comes across. These aren't story collections. These aren't epics where we have episodes and a long saga. These are single stories. And the more complex they are, the more sort of entertaining they are. But in, in no, in, at no time in these novellas do you lose the thread. You don't go into the individual stories and just enjoy them for their own sake. There aren't any individual stories. There's just one story in a novella. And going back to what I brought up earlier with Boccaccio and, and Goethe, novellas, just like in European literature, um, there's something new about them. They're not retellings. They're not new versions of myths. Um, nevertheless, they're somehow related to history. There's something believable about them. There's something hallowed about them, maybe old-fashioned. They're anchored in the past, right? But they're telling new stories based on the past. Okay, so more, exam more uh, information about novellas. Uh, this is what leads, led me to, to make the first step in my project. Um, these works that, I, that I've identified, that I've given you identifications for, they're prose, they're short, etc. These all come from about the same time period. So in Judea and in Egypt, uh, they both come from this period at the, after the Iron Age, when national independence was gone, and these, these regions were ruled by foreign emperors. During a context of traditional uh, literature and religion and culture being preserved and codified and transmitted by scholars, during those times, in this context of foreign empire, new literature is being written. So there's a balance of newness and oldness. And they relate to each other. Okay, so in Judea, right, this is the birthplace of the Hebrew Bible, biblical, uh, biblical Hebrew literature. Um, novellas all come from the Persian period. Maybe a little bit later, but they don't come from before. Uh, fifth and fourth centuries BC. In the, in the Egyptian side, um, I believe that most of these novellas can be dated to the Ptolemaic period. Now, this is tricky because most of the manuscripts are later. Most of the manuscripts come from the Roman period, so the 1st and 2nd century CE. But there's a lot of evidence that they were written earlier. And I think that connecting novellas to the Ptolemaic period is helpful because it, we, we can see the socially necessary background that allows a work of art like this to flourish. So in both Judea and Egypt, as I mentioned, we have these foreign empires that are uh, controlling these regions, but allowing there to be some kind of a local culture that's maintained. Okay, so in Judea, this is the beginning of the Second Temple period, right? During the Persian Empire, Cyrus and Darius, they come. The Judeans come back to Jerusalem, rebuild the Temple. This is when the Bible, as we know it, started to take shape. The Hebrew Bible, as we know it, the scrolls had been preserved and they were they were copied and standardized. That's when new novellas were written. Same thing in Egypt during the Ptolemaic period. This is this ended a long period of of um, periods of anarchy versus unity, but short-lived, uh, hated foreign rulers. In the Ptolemaic era, after Alexander the Great conquered Egypt, Egypt entered a long period of prosperity without any interruption. And it was in the interest of the rulers, the Ptolemies, to step in and to make sure the torchbearers of Egyptian civilization were happy, the priests, the people who worked in the temples. They're the ones who, who would legitimize the Ptolemies as pharaohs. And so... Um, I believe, just like in Judea, we have a time period where there is a traditional group of individuals who are encouraged and given the space 
to maintain their old traditions, right? The Ptolemaic state depends on it. They depend on these priests to to inscribe inscriptions on temples that depict the Ptolemaic pharaohs offering to the gods and being recognized as true pharaohs. So they're allowed to keep doing that, but at the same time, they're writing new literature. All of these stories, in some way, are historical fiction. Now, today that might mean a novel that is uh, written by somebody who knows a lot about ancient Rome, let's say, and is able to like make something very believable and make it almost look like it happened. It's not, it's not quite that when it comes to the novellas. But, I like, but it's an easy way to describe them. Every single novella takes place in the past at a defined time. It takes place in the past. It's anchored by specific people known from history and specific facts and things like that that, that ground it. Um, but it's not it's fiction. It's not, it's not history. It's not real. Uh, in the Judean side, novellas like Ruth, Esther, Jonah, um, Tobit, Judith, these take place in a specific time frame that's Sometimes better to find, sometimes not, right? But these are new stories that aren't retelling old ones. Same goes in Egypt. Um, novellas in the Ptolemaic period date from all over Egyptian history. Uh, a lot of them date from the Third Intermediate Period, which we're going to zoom in on in a minute. Um, but they all have this historical anchoring. So I think that makes sense. This is a time where uh, the past was in mind constantly, the golden age, maybe, of national uh, sovereignty. And the traditions from that period are being maintained and codified. And the literature of what I think of as entertainment and diversion uh, reflects that. It reflects that. The language of these novellas is interesting also. From Judea, uh, well, let's do Egypt first. It's easier. All the Egyptian novellas in this period are written in Demotic. At the same time, these individuals could write and read the classical Egyptian hieroglyphic language that was, that was reserved for religious texts and, and temple inscriptions, etc., but the uh, literature of, of entertainment was written in what approximated the everyday language more. Demotic came about as a very highly uh, abstract version of, of uh, hieratic, which is shorthand hieroglyphs, during the Sayite period. So 7th century, 6th century, Demotic started up, and it was used and adapted throughout Egypt, especially when the Sayites controlled all of Egypt. It was a, used by the Persians to make for the Egyptian official chancellery language. So Demotic sort of began, used, began being used all over Egypt. Um, originally, it was definitely close to the spoken language, which was constantly evolving. Classical hieroglyph, hieroglyphs weren't. That language is frozen for maybe a millennia. But Demotic was closer to the spoken language. Now, that changed as the centuries went on. It kind of became a frozen uh, literary idiom. Um, but Demotic literature... Uh, um, it's fascinating because we have this, uh, this, these individuals taking advantage of this new script that wasn't a traditional language of literature and making it a language of literature. That is not traditional. A few more features here. I know I'm speaking in the abstract. Not only are these novellas historical fiction, they all treat cherished cultural themes and classical institutions. Okay, so Jonah from the Hebrew Bible. That's a novella. It was written in the Persian period. And it's about a prophet who lived way back when Israel was still a thing, when Israel, the kingdom of Israel. It's about a prophet who's mentioned in the book of Kings, but we don't know anything about him. He was just somebody who was remembered. And so this author took advantage of that and wrote a new story that's crazy. It has nothing. There's no historical basis at all. This individual flees Yahweh. He's swallowed by a whale. He's spat up on the shore, right? None of this happened. Um, but it's a parody of prophecy. It's a parody, not to ridicule it as something unimportant, but it's playing with the idea of what it means to be a prophet of Yahweh. Um, not all reach the level of parody. So Ruth is another novella from the Hebrew Bible. It's definitely not parodied. On the other hand, it's anchored in traditional religious themes and motifs that are, would be known, let's say, from the book of Genesis. Um, in Egypt, the same deal, right? We have uh, the... We have novellas that are that feature characters who are interested in Egyptian hieroglyphs and in inscriptions and in uncovering magic scrolls. They're, they depict traditional religious ceremonies that go haywire. Um, these novellas are not they're they're grounded in traditional culture, and like I said, sometimes they like to parody them. Uh, also telling is they're not overtly religious. They might even be called secular. Some of them, not all of them. Now, when I say not overtly religious. I mean that they're not used for religious edification. I don't think Jonah can be used for religious edification. Now it can, but originally, it, it, 
now it is, I should say. <laughs> but originally, um, it was just really entertaining. These don't enshrine deep religious teachings. They don't, they don't advocate for religious reform or theological reflection. Other kinds of storytelling do, but these novellas don't. They intersect with it, but they play with it. Okay, uh, what are just to, to make sure it's clear what I mean by novellas, here's some examples. Judean novellas. Ruth, Esther, Jonah, those are all written in Hebrew and preserved in the Hebrew Bible. Tobit and Judith. Tobit is complicated. It was probably written in Aramaic originally. Um, only recently, in the last uh, century or so, were Aramaic copies rediscovered. It was before that only known in Greek. Judith, as the Academy is sort of coming around to asserting and believing rightly, was probably was written in Greek, but it was written in a Greek that looks like Hebrew translated into Greek. So in these 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 novellas were all written, like I said, in this Persian period, maybe a little bit later. Um, they all intersect with traditional history on the Judean side, um, but they all are. It's a very heterogeneous group in some ways, and themes they treat, etc. Uh, Egyptian novellas. Um, these aren't too widely familiar, even for people who are interested in, in ancient Egypt, um, because they're written in Demotic. They're not widely translated into English. Um, maybe the most famous is the story Setna One, what we call it, Setna Kamwas and the Mummies. Um, this is so famous that it basically, uh, the story told there, made its way into the movie The Mummy with Boros Karloff. Um, uh, and, and some other examples here that I've listed. These are the five that have been the best preserved. But... Uh, the issue with studying demonic novellas is that there are dozens that have survived, and I'm, I mean that very literally dozens, but most of them are very, very fragmentary. Oops, there's my cursor, sorry. They're very fragmentary. They have to be painstakingly reconstructed. So these are five survive intact enough that we can get a very good idea what they are about. None of them survives complete. My final minutes here, I want to focus on just one of these Egyptian novellas, uh, what we call the battle for the prebend of Amun. Prebend is a French word that's drawn from uh, the uh, feudalism that has to do with it, it, it describes a an office that's appointed by somebody that it involves inheriting land and a proper inheriting property and, and the wealth that comes with that um, this is a story uh, that is preserved very well on a single scroll that's that's now called by Spiegelberg uh, named after its uh, first publisher um, it probably comes from Akmim which is from north of Thebes uh, there's 18 pretty well preserved columns of this novella here's one of them uh, this manuscript was probably written around the first century BCE. It might be a little bit older than that. Some would date it several centuries older. Some would say that this is pretty close to when it was first written. That's sort of where I tend to be. Now, I wanted to quickly show you that this is what a lot of it looks like now. Fragments have turned up in museums across the world, like in Pennsylvania or Philadelphia. So uh, this is a, this is um, the problem with studying demonic literature, is that um, it's everywhere, literally. Uh, what is this story about? Well, here's the cast of characters. Oh, here's one more. Sorry, here's one more uh, fragment of it. This is actually very important. Um, this, manus this this novella exists in several copies. Now, there's three, I think, that survive. Two are very fragmentary that look just like this. And what's frustrating is that they're not a perfect match. Well, it's it's frustrating because, it, well, it's not. It's actually not frustrating because it gives, gives me a lot of work, right? So these these fragments of this novella are different in very imp interesting ways. Which makes us think: How? Why did they differ? Was it were there different versions that circulated independently? Um, did somebody sort of misremember parts of it? it? Brings up a lot of issues. So this novella has sort of four groups of main characters. It takes place in this time period, which we call the Third Intermediate Period. This is when Egypt was broken up into different dynasties. There was no sort of uh, one pharaoh that had control over the entire land. That happened at the end during the Sayite Renaissance. This is before that period. We have a pharaoh named Pedubastus and his entourage who are traveling to Thebes to meet with the Amun priesthood. Uh, in particular, Pedubastus desires that his son Ankor is going to succeed the high priest of Amun. So this is an important political office. Um, now, so they, they come to Thebes apparently to have this transaction verified and to make this succession actually happen. But they're interrupted by a group from Buto, which is in the Delta. A priest of Horus, who's actually the son of the high priest of Amun, shows up unexpectedly, interrupts the proceedings, and says that, no, I am going to be the rightful successor of the high priest of Amun. Uh, battle ensues for a long period. Um, it's very exciting. This, it's, it's, there's, there's a lot of fighting in this story, like a lot of novellas from this period. Um, 
Pharaoh Pedibasis is sort of down and out with his crew. Before coming to Thebes, they uh, offend, really not Pedibasis, but his grandson Jedhor, who's the son of Ankor, the supposed new uh, high priest woman, offended the sons of Ineros, particularly Petacons and Paimi. So they wanted to accompany Pharaoh, but they didn't. They were convinced by Jedhor to not come. That upset them. Uh, Ineros is a legendary king. Um, I'll talk about it in just a second. But uh, Ineros's clan would have been a rival clan to Pharaoh's clan. So this novella is intersecting with a lot of what we know from this period of history, from the Third Intermediate Period. It wouldn't have been written then because it's so fantastical. But it was clearly engineered to have relevance or resonance uh, in the historical record. So, of course, uh, as you would expect in a, in a plot like this, there's a twist, and it turns out that Pharaoh needs Petacons and Pymie to help him. So he has to, he's has got egg on his face, basically. He, he, they didn't allow them to come with him to Thebes, and he eventually has to send a letter begging them to come and help him. And that's when the novella breaks off. It looks like they, shows, they show back up. We don't know how it ends. We've lost most of the beginning and the end, unfortunately. Uh, so we can point to the Third Intermediate Period as... Um, the background of this story. And there's a lot of novellas from this period that have the same background. In fact, they're, usually, they're often called by scholars the Ineros cycle. So by cycle, we mean discrete stories that are generally related to each other. Cycle is appropriate. Maybe I would apply the term a bit more loosely because these don't string together like episodes in a grand historical saga. Nevertheless, uh, Pedibastus, um, Ineros, Paimi, Petacons, these are all names we know from history in about the 7th century BCE. Ineros himself was from Athribis, which is oops, which is right here. Athribis uh, was an important city in the delta. Ineros, there is an Ineros from history known to have uprose, uprose to have resisted the onslaught and the uh, dom dominion of Ashurbanipal, the Assyrian emperor. Uh, in 665 BCE. This might be the Ineros of that was taken into legend and underlies stories like this Prebens novella. Um, Pedibastus was uh, was a rival of his, but Ineros is, uh, was a predecessor of Semeticus I, who became the the uh, the, uh, the the leader, the first pharaoh of the 26th dynasty, which reunited Egypt, uh, the Saite dynasty. So you can see why um, audiences would be interested in this time period, because uh, this is a time when Egypt transitioned from sort of this fragmented chaos to nice united Egypt once again, um, on the verge of that. So this is sort of an exciting period. It's kind of like the Wild West for us today. So uh, this conflict between uh, Pharaoh and the high priest of Amun Maybe not really conflict, but they're clearly sort of uh, there's a there's a power struggle here. This is definitely something known from history. Um, where did my curse? I'm sorry. I, there we go. Uh, we have inscriptions from Karnak. This is a high priest of Amun named Osirkan. He later became a pharaoh um, of the 23rd dynasty. Um, this is the last time a high priest of Amun ever legitimized a pharaoh and, and accepted them as legitimate. Um, in this inscription, he talks about them celebrating a festival together. Um, this actually happens in the story. So the story of the prep and of Amun, uh, much, it, it, much of the surviving part of the manuscript takes place during a festival. That festival is the beautiful festival of the valley. This is one of the most prominent festivals from Pharaonic Egypt. It started in the Middle Kingdom under Mentuhotep II, probably, but it really came into prominence in the New Kingdom. Now, what happened in this festival, celebrated once a year, and the, a, 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 the statue of Amun in a processional ceremonial boat, what we would call a bark, Egyptologists call a bark, was carried by priests in a procession from Karnak in his temple, in a it would have been re at rest in a shrine, crossing the Nile, and visiting the temples of the deceased pharaohs. And eventually, this bark would stop off at the tombs of prominent noblemen. This is um, a depiction of the bark being carried by priests during the procession. So the statue of Amun is in the middle. Let me get my laser pointer up. Right in here, in this shrine, we can see through it. They've made sure we can see it, although this would have been veiled from the public. Um, it's carried by priests. Here's the high priest of Amun with the lion skin around his shoulder. This would have been brought by hand 
um, like a king being processed, right, in a, in a dice, um, to different uh, tombs. Here's a depiction that the Epigraphic Survey published from Karnak of the barge itself. This would have carried the shrine across the Nile. It's a boat within a boat. So here's the, the ceremonial bark that would have been loaded onto it and ferried across the Nile, then taken out and carried by the priests. Um, this bark, the barge itself, so we say barge to, to make sure we're clear about what we're talking about. I, I use barge to, defer to refer to the boat that carries it. Um, the barge itself is very special. This is actually Ramses II offering uh, incense to uh, the statue of Amun. Um, there's many, many depictions of this, this barge and also the, the processional bark in Egyptian temples, especially in the, uh, the ones that are interested, interesting for us are ones from the Ptolemaic period. So this is a scene from the Bark Chapel in Karnak. Bark Chapel is where the processional bark would have been stored. Um, this was built or rebuilt by Philip Aridaeus. Now, he was the feeble half-brother of Alexander the Great. He was never actually the pharaoh, um, but um, he sort of ruled in name only until Ptolemy just took definitive power. So under his auspices, uh, right off the bat, Clearly, this means that this festival was important for the Ptolemies in establishing their foothold in Egypt and sort of justifying their power ideologically. Um, right off the bat, this uh, a chapel for the bark of Tutmosis III, way back from the 18th dynasty, was re renovated, recarved, and covered over and made new by Philip, uh, and um, showing us, like I said, the importance of this fe this uh, festival. This is the festival that takes place in the middle of the Preben novella. So it seems that the handoff, the official, the um, the ratification of this this um, this new succession of the high priesthood by uh, where's my laser by Ankor, who's going to succeed the high priest of Amun, was going to happen during this festival. And in fact, it's almost over, and it seems that they are about to load the ceremonial bark back on the barge when the priest of Horus Bud of Budo shows up. He shows up dramatically, completely unexpected and makes it so that they cannot finish the festival. This is bad, right? Like, you need to finish the festival or else you risk, like, cos cosmic damage or something by not, not having the, the, the god return to his shrine. So the priest of Horus arrives on the scene. He says, I am the one who should, in fact, be in possession uh, after this high priest of this, this Preben of Amun. <clears throat> now, I, I believe I mentioned that he is, in fact, the son of the high priest, but that is not... The reasoning he gives. Uh, the reasoning he gives is very uh, difficult to understand. What happens is this priest speaks in very technical theological language, uh, describing he's a priest from Budo, which means he is a priest of Horus, the falcon god Horus. He evokes the myth of Horus, especially when Horus is visiting the grave of his father Osiris, who's now the king of the underworld. Horus would visit his grave every year and off pour water, make make religious offerings at his tomb. <clears throat> Excuse me. The priest describes this mythological fact, this mythological sequence, but interprets uh, it in a new way, inserting Amun in the proceedings. Uh, so Amun is made out to be the one who actually enables Horus to cross the river, who enables Horus to safely be able to complete his filial duty. The sort of uh, the most pointed part of the speech of this priest happens when he goes through. He's pointing, indicating to the barge that carries a ceremonial bark. So we have to imagine the bark was probably still still held by the priest this whole time, probably near or in the possession of Pedubastus, the pharaoh. The barge was on the river. They're probably at the dock. They're at the bank, ready to load it on. And uh, the priest is points to each part of the barge and interprets it in terms of that Horus and Amun myth. So I have two short extracts here. The planks of the bark, the, he says, are the enemies who have cleared the path. The bolt of the mast is Ray, because it is Amun who ha hastens on the bark that carries Horus, etc. What is this language he uses? How does this convince the priests? Because once the priests hear this, they're like, yeah, this guy definitely is right. He, he does deserve this. What is it about this that, that how would this speak to, to priests, not just in the story, but the audience of this novella, who would have been Egyptian priests? Well, the language is very evocative of technical, theological, and scholarly discourse used in context of exegesis, of elucidation. 
So we see there's two parts to each sentence. There's the thing that's being, I, oops, I'm using my cursor, I need my laser pointer. There's the thing that everybody sees, the planks, and it's being equated to something you don't see, the enemies. There's a thing you see, the bolt of the mast, and it's equated with something you don't see, ray. This language is all over priestly literature, and I should say uh, technical, scholarly priestly literature from the, from the Greco-Roman period. Here's one example of many. This is from an inscription on the Temple of Edfu, roughly contemporaneous for when this manuscript was inscribed, Papyrus Spiegelberg. Here, a very archaic, arcane and ar arcane ritual, which uh, no point to get into the details here, um, is summarized, and then uh, this process of elucidation, of explication, of exegesis is given in the temple ritual itself, inscribed on the walls of Edfu. So, uh, there's trampling of fish that the priests do. Okay. Know the elucidation of the trampling. The fish are the enemy, blah, blah, blah. The, lament the lamenting of their geese is the boss. The dom palm fans are the hare. It's the same sort of A-B language we see uh, in Prevent. So going back to that, and like I said, this is all over t text from this period. We see it in magical scrolls where there's magical spells and then they're followed by elucidations. So the person practicing it knows exactly what they're saying. Right? This is secret priestly knowledge. This is not knowledge for people who weren't practicing these rituals, because knowing it can be harmful. Knowledge is power, right? So this language is evokes for the audience secrecy. It evokes deep religious meaning. It also evokes scholarly training. Um, it evokes the kind of um, manuals you memorize as a priest and the kind of language we use. And so that is what the priest is doing here when he explains the parts of this barge in terms of the horse myth. And that justifies his claim on this prevent. And when he finishes speaking, Pharaoh Potabasis is like, he turns to the, to the priest of Amun, he's like, why didn't you guys tell me this? <laughs> and they say, we've never heard this before. We've never seen it written in a scroll. That's what they say. So to, to decide if this priest is right, that, remember there's a, there's a bark of Amun being carried. Uh, they make an oracular inquiry. So all the time in these processions, when the god statues would come out being carried by priests, people would ask questions, and the priests would be tipping one way or the other to affirm or to deny the truth of things that people say. This is sort of an oracle. So they ask the statue of Amun, is this priest right? And Amun nods yes. <laughs> he nods yes. So the story continues. These, uh, this priest of Budo fights with Pharaoh's men. Uh, unfortunately, the very end of it is broken. But we have enough. Um, that we can point to aspects that define it as a novella in the ways that I've been saying. This is a novella that, this is a work of narrative literature that plays deliberately, maybe even parodies, um, really important parts of the priestly know-how, of their toolbox, let's say. Not to mention cherished cultural institutions like this Festival of the Valley. So I really appreciate you watching this and your attention. Um, I hope I've encouraged you to maybe pursue some of this more. I want to share with you really quickly um, two books that have a lot of demotic literature in them. Um, on the left, we have the literature of ancient Egypt. Make sure you get the third edition. Um, the demotic literature was translated by the Oriental Institute's own Robert Rittner. Um, there's a few demotic texts that are found in another volume by Miriam Lichtheim, uh, volume three, the late period of her ancient Egyptian literature. There's, a, there's one or two, um, there's, an, there's one extract from an Inneros novella um, that's, that's definitely worth looking at. Um, and also, that's where you can find the line in search of the man that I talked about earlier. So again, thank you for your attention. Um, I very much enjoyed speaking with all of you, and I hope you're well. Bye.